Welcome everyone to our session on how to improve your memory. My name is Paul Novak. I'm the founder and CEO here at Iris Reading. And today we're going to be covering a workshop that I think you'll find helpful if you've got a lot of things to remember. And this is specifically useful for situations where you even need to memorize information. So we'll cover several memory techniques. We'll talk a little bit about note taking. We'll talk about when you should review your notes as well. And this is not just helpful to people that are students, but even to professionals. I mean, if you're uh, working and part of your work involves not just reading things, but also presenting and speaking with your colleagues about that information, well, we want to make sure our memory is uh, solid enough that we can remember things that we've read and things like that. So uh, let's get on to things. And I just want to make a reminder here that you can subscribe to us on YouTube if you want to keep in touch with content that we're going to be providing on a weekly basis, whether that's live streams or videos that we upload, you can find that. And what we do at Iris Reading is we teach a variety of what are essentially study skills. And that includes speed reading, that includes uh, note taking, that includes memory, like we're going to cover today. And things like, uh, I think all of this falls under the umbrella of productivity. So if we're efficient readers, if we can memorize things, take notes efficiently, that makes us more uh, more productive in life and we can squeeze more things out of our day. So if you want more of that content, subscribe on YouTube. We are actually live streaming uh, kind of experimentally on several platforms all at once here. So in one corner on a screen, I've got uh, LinkedIn over here where we're broadcasting. We're also broadcasting on uh, Facebook and YouTube and also through Zoom. So if you uh, like what we're doing here at Iris Reading, go ahead and uh, subscribe. Mainly, I'd say on YouTube is where we're going to have more of that content. So just search for us, Iris Reading, on YouTube. Now, as readers, we want to have three areas covered. We want a decent speed, we want comprehension, and we want retention. And I'm drawing a distinction between comprehension and retention because they're not exactly the same. You want to think of comprehension as you know, when you're reading something at that present moment, what are you understanding? And retention is later on, after you're done reading, what do you remember? Sometimes your comprehension might be good at the moment, but later we might forget things. And that's a retention issue. Today, we're going to focus more in this presentation on retention. And this kind of leads us to part of the reason why our organization is named IRIS. It is an acronym for how you would approach information if you're trying to read it comprehensively and efficiently. So it starts with something called an inspection. And when I say inspect, I mean really just getting familiar with something before you read it. This is very straightforward advice, but the average person does not do this. Uh, inspecting, if it's a chapter or, or whatever you happen to be reading, it's a matter of looking at, uh, let's say, the introduction, the headings and subheadings, uh, boldface words, things that are popping off the page, even things in italics or bullet points. Uh, and then you might have charts, tables, diagrams. You just read the titles and then the conclusion at the end. So the idea here is instead of just reading something beginning to end, page by page, what you're doing first is you're kind of skipping through and just reading things selectively, the most important or most general parts first getting a sense of the structure, the big picture. You ever hear that quote, when you get caught up in details, you lose sight of the big picture? This is uh, one of the reasons why people can be reading something very complex and then they end up having poor comprehension because they're getting caught up in those details. The details don't matter unless we keep that big picture in mind. So if you had something really short to read, like this article right here, you read the first sentence of each paragraph first. There's no headings or subheadings here. So I'm just going to read all my first sentences because those are usually main ideas. So after we're done inspecting, next step is to read the material. Assuming it's still relevant, assuming that you got to read it. I say that because I'm no longer in school, so I don't have professors telling me, read this, read that. I get to read uh, what I choose to read. So sometimes I might inspect and decide, you know what, uh, I got the gist of it. Maybe that's enough for the purpose in which I'm reading. Other times I might say, okay, I'm inspecting the material. Now I do actually want to read this because I'm actually interested and it's worth my time. So I'm reading, I'm getting my details. What do you do when you're done reading? Well, you inquire about what you just read. When I say inquire, I mean ask questions. Questions help focus the mind. 
So some of your questions might be, what are the biggest takeaways? What do I need to memorize? And questions, they will, it's better than just reading a chapter, finishing it and saying, okay, I'm done and uh, that's it. Better to stop for a moment. It could be 30 seconds or a minute and just thinking about what you read. That's what we mean by inquire, asking questions to reflect on what you just read. Now, let's say one of those questions is, okay, what do I need to memorize? And it leads me to this step of, okay, how am I going to store this information? Again, remember, this is an acronym for IRIS, inspect, read, inquire, store. We're going to focus heavily over here. So first, when it comes to storing and remembering, we all know repetition helps you remember things. I'll repeat that. Repetition helps you remember. I've got some musical imagery here because music is a good example of repetition. Isn't it true that there are songs you know that you haven't heard in years, but you remember the lyrics to the song? That's all about repetition, right? When that song was popular, you heard it over and over again. Uh, or um, even if you didn't like the song, if you hear something enough, you'll remember the lyrics. I mean, there are songs that I absolutely do not like, but I know the lyrics. I'm thinking uh, that song, Baby Shark. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, repetition is how we remember. And of course, music has a lot of other repetition, like the beat or the melody repeats, the chorus repeats. So music is full of it, repetition. Now, when it comes to reading, uh, repetitions, we got to get them in different ways. It, it's not about, like, if I'm on chapter five in this book, I don't want to read chapter five five times. I want to read it one time, and I want to understand it as best as possible. So how do we get our reps in? How do we get our repetitions in? Well, you can do it through this process. This is a repetition. So think of it as an exposure to the information. That's a repetition. I inspect the material. I got all the general info. I read the material, I get a lot of detail now. And then I stop when I'm done reading and I inquire about what I just read. That's another repetition because I'm actively thinking, what did I just read? What were the most important ideas? What do I need to memorize? And then this is another repetition as well, getting our mind focused on how am I gonna memorize this? Or, no, I mean, not mem we're not memorizing 30 page chapters here. Usually it's something very specific that you gotta memorize. Like, uh, I don't know, let's say you're reading this book here, Animal Farm by George Orwell, the classic. Quick little read, 100 pages. You could read this book beginning to end, understand it fully well, but guess what? On page 19, there's something here called the Seven Commandments. What if you got to memorize that? Or something else. What if you got to remember in order? So this is where we need to dive a little deeper on what affects our memory besides just repetition. So there's something called visualization, and that is what psychologists call your mind's eye. That's your ability to visualize something that isn't necessarily there. Like if I say uh, visualize a cup of coffee, you can do it. You can think of a mug or, I mean, I've got a cup of coffee here from Starbucks. Um, you can visualize something like that, even if it's not there. L let's say I asked you to visualize a family member. It could be brother, sister, your mom or dad, or even a close friend. We can close our eyes and think about what they would look like. Actually, you don't even have to close your eyes. You can just visualize in your head Oh, that's what my friend Pete looks like. That's the power of visualization. We can actually use this to our advantage. And keep in mind that this is part of the reason why you forget someone's name, but you remember their face. Now, you may have forgotten uh, my name. And if I take away the webcam, as I just did, and I turn it back on, let's say I turn it back on and there's a different face on here you would uh, recognize, hey, that's not the same dude. But if I turn my webcam on uh, and you see me again, hello, uh, you see the same face, I haven't changed. It's easier to remember a face, right? Because a face is visual information. But what about my name? I, I told you my name at the beginning, and if you forgot it, I'm not bothered by that because everybody forgets names. I've done it, you've done it, it happens. But why did you forget the name but you remember the face? Because visual information is easier to remember than verbal information, okay? That's why companies have logos in addition to their names. Or that's why this happens. You uh, forget someone's name, but you remember meeting them. If you have trouble with uh, remembering names, by the way, we have a course on our website you can check out. It's uh, how to remember names more effectively. Go, go to, you can go to irisreading.com to find that. Anyway, so we forget names, we remember faces. Here's the thing, besides this, 
there's something called association. That is another way that we remember and learn. You associate one thing with something else. We're going to use this to our advantage. And the fact that you remember things that are weird. Think about it. At some point in the history of McDonald's, there was a marketing meeting and they're like, okay, everybody, how do we sell more cheeseburgers? And somebody had the crazy idea, what if we use a creepy clown? Maybe that will help us sell cheeseburgers. And somebody was like, you know what? That's just crazy enough that it might work. And they started using Ronald McDonald. I mean, this is not the only example of weird things. You can think of a lot of companies or commercials you've seen, right? That are weird. It tell, you can tell me, tell me in the comments below. I'm curious to know. Well, we got people on here, and I know we got people from all over the place. And I'm curious to know also where are you joining us from? I'm broadcasting out of the Miami area. Uh, my hometown is Chicago. I moved here a couple years ago, but I was born and raised in Chicago. Tell me where you're uh, joining us from, and let me know what kind of things do you think of when you think of weird things like in commercials. Maybe you're thinking of Geico, and they're talking gecko. Or uh, I went to the movies yesterday and there were some commercials, you know, before they do the trailers even, there are some like ads and there was a Coca-Cola ad of like polar bears drinking Coke. Polar bears drinking Coke? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you're wondering why polar bears are on the brink of extinction, maybe it's because they're drinking too much Coke. So... <laughs> I mean, why do companies do this? They do it on purpose because they know you're going to remember things better if they give you something weird, right? So we're going to use this to our advantage. How? When we got to store information, let's take an example um, of uh, this book right here, Brain Rules. And uh, there's 12 chapters in this book, 12 Principles for Surviving and Thriving at Work, Home, and School. It's a good read. I've read it before. It's about 300 pages. But let's say you've read the whole book and now you decide, okay, what do I got to store? Maybe you got quiz or test coming up and you got to memorize these 12 things or maybe you got to talk about this book and give a presentation about what it's about and you want to remember that one was exercise next they talked about survival three was wiring attention short-term memory long-term memory sleep stress sensory integration vision music and exploration got it i'd be surprised if you had all of that memorized right now Maybe you've got a few in your head, but let's talk about how we can memorize this. Not just through repetition, because that's that's the default way that some people approach this. They're like, oh, just write this down a bunch, or I'll repeat it over and over again. And that's a very boring way to learn. A better way is to take advantage of some of these things we talked about. Visualization, association, and uh, this I would call exaggeration. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, I'm going to teach you this numeric peg system and please pay attention if you've never heard of this, because it's so easy to learn and it's very easy to implement and powerful too, if you want to use a simple but powerful way to remember. So the numeric peg system, basically what you're going to do is you're going to associate the numbers one through 10 with visuals. Okay. So I'll tell you the visuals that I want you to memorize and you just try to memorize them. Okay, and it's not going to be hard because one is a pencil. Why? Because it has the same shape. That's all. One is a pencil. Two is a swan. You see the same shape? Two is going to be a swan. And I'm going to run through them fast. So, I mean, you could always pause this presentation. Even if you're joining the live stream, you could pause it to review or you could write things down. But one is a pencil. Two is a swan. Three is McDonald's. Okay, you got to look at it sideways here. Four is a chair. I know some people do their fours like this. I make my fours like that, so it kind of looks like an upside down chair. So for me, I use the visual of a chair. Honestly, you can use whatever visuals you want. I'm just giving you the sample images here, okay? Like the number one uh, could also be like a tie, you know, a tie that just goes on a shirt, uh, you know, straight down. But I use pencil for number one. Two is swan. Three is McDonald's. Four is a chair. You see the seat here? The backrest. Legs. Okay, five is a hook. See the curvy part here? Five. Five. Five is the hook. All right, six is a cherry. You see the cherry here with the stem coming out? Seven is lightning. Do you see lightning over here? There's a seven right there, right? Another number seven. So when you think of seven, you got to think of lightning. Eight is a racetrack. So you got this racetrack here, even though it'd be kind of weird with having an intersection there. Nine is a balloon. They got the balloon with the, you know, string coming out. 10 is a play setting. So you got the plates or a bowl, whatever you want, a play setting, and some silverware. You know, it could be a spoon, a fork, chopsticks, anything. 
So you see a one here and a zero here to represent a place setting for 10. So if you had to review, you're just like, okay, pencil, swan, McDonald's, ch chair, hook, cherry, lightning, racetrack, balloon, and place setting. So now you should have these memorized. Or if you don't, just pause and try to memorize it. It's not that hard, right? Because they have the same shapes as the number. The thing you got to do at this point is you got to associate to each respective topic. So number one, whatever the topic is for number one, we got to use a pencil and the topic and come up with some visual in our head that ties these two together. And it's also very important that these visuals are exaggerated and kind of weird. So for number one, it's exercise, right? Exercise. So, I mean, the visual that I came up with was, okay, I'm just going to exercise reminds me of like going to the gym. Imagine you uh, have a new gym that's opening up in your neighborhood and you go there and you notice something weird about this gym. Everybody there is working out with pencils. Okay, somebody's like on the bench press with a pencil, someone doing the shoulder press with a pencil, curls with a pencil. Imagine maybe you're regretting signing up for this gym. <laughs> That's how we might remember one is exercise, two is a swan. So we got to associate something survival related with swan. Uh, in my head, I pictured a swan struggling for survival in that it was drowning, which doesn't make sense because swan should have a default setting of knowing how to swim. So this one was drowning at survival. We need to associate wiring with McDonald's. I pictured going to McDonald's and I took a bite out of a Big Mac and there was a piece of barbed wire in my Big Mac. I got to remember wiring, so that's what I'm going with. Four is attention. Five is short-term memory, right? We got to associate these things with their respective images, okay? So like six, I just pictured long-term memory, a cherry with a ridiculously long stem, okay? Like two or three feet long. Same thing with sleep and lightning, stress and number eight. For number eight, I pictured uh, the race car driver stressed out about that intersection there. Like they might actually crash. I pictured them sweating. So if you picture this in your mind, it becomes easier. So you gotta remember all these things. Sensory integration gets associated with a balloon, vision associated with a plate or a bowl. I picture a bowl filled with eyeballs. And then when you get to 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, whatever you need to memorize, how do we scale this system up? There's an easy way to do it. You got to come up with a rule. You could think of it also as a theme. And that rule has to apply to all the numbers 11 through 20. So what's the rule? The rule could actually be anything you want. The rule that I use is snow. That doesn't have to be snow. Your rule could be something else. It could be rain. It doesn't have to be weather related. It could be a theme or rule related to cars or books or babies or celebrities. So let's say it's snow, okay? Here's how this works. When you get to 11, you gotta reuse a pencil in your image that you come up with in your mind. You gotta also use snow and the topic. When you get to 12, you do the same thing. Swan, snow, and the topic. So what are the topics? Well, we got we got to remember music for number 11, exploration for number 12. So what do we do here? We take 11 and we're like, okay, pencil, snow. Music reminds me of like, a, you know, a composer, composing music. But I would picture a composer in the snow, in like a blizzard-like conditions, composing music with, instead of a baton that they use, I would picture they're using a giant pencil. Not like this, but like a really, really giant pencil in the snow, in like blizzard-like conditions. Uh, 12. I got to associate swan, snow, and exploration. So the way this works, when you're doing this on your own, you just got to think to yourself, what is the first thing that pops into my mind when I think of exploration? L let me know in the comments when well, exploration equals what for you. Uh, for me, it's space. Like I'm fascinated with space exploration and all that. Um, I, I don't have a degree in physics or anything like that, but it's just a topic of interest. So I think of space when I think space exploration. Exploration also reminds me of Indiana Jones. Also reminds me of Dora the Explorer. <laughs> exploration also reminds me of like traveling. Uh, I, I travel a lot to do these kind of workshops for companies and schools. And uh, by the way, if you want to invite us on site, feel free to shoot me an email, paul at irisreading.com, and we'll organize something at your school, uh, whether it's in person or even as a webinar but I went the space route. So I pictured a giant swan shaped spaceship because I got to use a swan. Oh, and I got to use snow as well. 
So uh, we're gonna we're gonna make it snow. We're not gonna make it rain. We're gonna make it snow. See my uh, amazing Photoshop abilities here. Yeah, it's just uh, snowing in space. I know that makes no sense, but you want things to not make sense. Remember we said you remember things that are weird. That's what advertisers do to take advantage of our brains. We should take advantage of the way our brain works too. And researchers that study memory have a name for this. They call it, what we're doing is called elaborative encoding. So elaborative encoding is just an academic term for come up with something weird and you're more likely to remember it. So I'm picturing a giant swan-shaped spaceship exploring outer space with this kid astronaut in the snow, which doesn't make sense. And then you can make more rules as you need them. If you got to remember 25 things or 33 things, just make a new rule for the next 10. The rule that I use for 21 through 30 is uh, there's got to be like a fight going on. For 31 through 40, you can make another rule. Now, there's another technique called the memory palace technique. The memory palace technique is a few thousand years old but it's gold. It was used by the ancient Greeks to remember things and you can use it too. The way this one works is you got to take a location you're familiar with. And the best practice is to use your home, but you can use whatever you want. And what you're doing here is you're making a walkthrough of your home. So think about it this way. What is location number one when you're uh, coming home from work or school? Maybe location number one is the front door. It doesn't have to be. Number one could be your driveway if you, or your garage. Or number one could be the mailbox if you check your mailbox before you get, a, get home. Then you go to location number two and three and four and you make a walkthrough. You got to memorize a walkthrough of your home and you never repeat a location. And I've got 10 locations here, but you could have as many locations as you need. It could be eight, it could be 12, it could be 20. So what do we do? Well, uh, and this is just one approach. You could take another approach, by the way. Uh, when you wake up, what's your morning routine? You wake up, you're in your bedroom, right? And then what's next after that? And so on and so forth. And you do a walkthrough of your morning routine. And it could continue beyond your front door. You leave your front door. Now you're getting in the car or the bus or the train going to work or school. And then it's the first street you encounter. Maybe now you continue your memory palace from school or work. And why do we do this? The goal is to associate things that you got to remember. So I'll give you an example. Let's say we got to remember something tech related. And let's say there are 10 companies, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, Netflix, and the list goes on. Maybe it's like the top 10 companies that are largest in the tech sector of the US. And by the way, this is just a made up list. Although I do think Apple is number one in the US as far as the largest tech company by market capitalization. Anyway, so Apple is number one. I got to associate to location number one. Let's say this is location number one. Okay. Well, how are we going to memorize or picture or visualize Apple? We can pick various images, right? Maybe you picture a bunch of apples in your mailbox, or there's like 10 iPhones for some reason in your mailbox. That'd be weird. I would picture, Apple reminds me of uh, Steve Jobs. So I would picture the ghost of Steve Jobs flying out of my mailbox. For two, Amazon. Okay, I picture maybe a giant box from Amazon at my front door. Or maybe Steve Jobs, not Steve Jobs, but <laughs> Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. Maybe he's delivering me a box at my front door from Amazon. Facebook, I'd picture Mark Zuckerberg. Oh, I got associates to the stairway. I'd picture Mark Zuckerberg on my stairway, and he's just kind of checking his Facebook. He's like, oh, hey, Paul. And I'd be like, Mark Zuckerberg, why have you violated my privacy yet again by breaking into my home? So if you can get yourself riled up, angry, use your emotions, that helps. I'm not saying you always get angry. You can come up with emotions that are positive, like something really funny and silly. All of this helps to remember things because your emotions play a part in how you remember things too. Uh, Twitter, I don't know, blue birds flying around the living room. You get the idea. But the cool thing about this technique is you could also use it to remember details. What if you got to remember three details about Twitter, five details about Facebook? four things about Amazon. The way you do it is you visualize each detail and you put those three details in three areas of the living room. Now, the other benefit of this technique is you have a lot of locations you're familiar with, your home, where you go to school or where you used to go to school, uh, your workplace, 
What about your friend's place? What about grandma's place? What about your childhood home? There are so many locations you can use and that comes in handy when you gotta remember a lot of stuff. And I say a lot of stuff, that pertains to situations like if you're a student, finals week. Finals week comes around, there's a lot of things you gotta memorize. Maybe you use your house to remember your history class. Another class, maybe I'll, I'll use my buddy's place and so on. All right, what about vocabulary? Because I get this question a lot. I need to remember new vocabulary or I'm studying a new language. There is a technique to help you improve your vocabulary. And this pertains to remembering the meaning of words. It's called the similar sound technique. The way the similar sound technique helps you remember words is by basically taking a similar sound from a word, like let's say claustrophobia, you focus on claws, we associate to Santa Claus, and then we combine that with the meaning. So I, my daughter, she doesn't know what, she's seven, she doesn't know what claustrophobia means. She's aware of Santa Claus. So I could use this and say, okay, imagine it's the night before Christmas, you hear some yelling outside, turns out Santa Claus is stuck in a chimney, and he is terrified of getting stuck in chimneys because he is claustrophobic. He, this is, word means the fear of closed spaces. I just gotta remind her that it's not the fear of Santa Claus, but you get the idea. Let me give you a word you don't know, or I'm assuming you don't know. Balone phobia. Balone phobia is the fear of needles, okay? That'd be nice if they called it needle phobia, but they don't make it that easy. Okay, balone phobia. Imagine, well, not imagine, focus here, balone. What sounds do you see or picture? Now for me, balone kind of sounds like balloon. Balone, balloon. Now it's not the fear of balloons, it's the fear of needles, but I'm gonna use a balloon um, for my image. But you don't have to. It could be be lo like baloney the lunch meat, or B, loan, that's another option. I'm gonna go the balloon route and associate the balloon to the fear of needles. I'd picture a giant red balloon afraid of needles. Like it's sweating, it's yelling for help. Maybe all of this is happening in slow motion and the balloon is like, no! And the, you know, in slow motion, eventually the needles pop this poor balloon. The more dramatic you make these things, the better. Remember that word, elaborative encoding, which if you don't want to remember the word, just remember that you remember things that are ridiculous. We can maybe call this the principle of ridiculousness. It's not really an academic term, but you get the idea. Anthrophobia, this is the fear of people. You could get that from the prefix, right, anthro? But what if you're not a scholar that knows all the Latin and Greek prefixes? I certainly don't know these things. We don't have to remember it, like anthro as in anthropology, right? study of people. You could also focus on ants. Now, this is not the fear of ants, it's the fear of people. We would just use the ant or ants to help us remember. I have a picture of a bunch of ants afraid of people stepping on them, like a village full of ants, and there's just footsteps crashing down upon their little ant village, thousands of them running for cover. And that's how I remember that. It could even be applied to other languages. Here's the Spanish word for boat. It's barco. So if I have to remember barco means boat, I'll just think, okay, um, I see the sound here, bark. Bark reminds me of a, like a dog barking. I picture a dog on a boat stranded at sea. Or maybe I try to make it more silly and picture a dog like this in a cardboard boat stranded at sea. Maybe it's barking for help. Uh, here's a German word for movie theater, kino. So imagine, kino is, kind of sounds like rhino, kino, rhino. Not the same sound, but this is not the same sound technique. It's the similar sound technique. So imagine you're sitting in a movie theater, halfway through the movie, a bunch of rhinos bust through the screen. They start chasing people around. Imagine all the blood and gore associated with that. So the more specific and visual you can be, the better with this. So again, it's not, the kino is basically movie theater. We're just using the rhino to remember. Now, by the way, I am Polish, so I'll teach you a Polish word. And this is just the word for house. It's pronounced dom, and dom just means home or house, dom. Now, dom kind of sounds like the English word dome. So imagine a dome surrounding your house, like a snow globe dome. Maybe it's to protect you against the weather. So when we're trying to store, we got three options now, three techniques we covered in a pretty short period of time. Numeric peg system, using numbers to remember things. Memory palace, using locations to remember things. 
and the similar sound technique using sounds to visually remember things. Now, there's also note taking. When you're taking notes, I mean, if you're looking for a really good course on how to take notes more effectively, go to our website, uh, irisreading.com, and I'll post the link in the chat where you can find. Uh, we have a course that goes over, if you just go irisreading.com slash courses, or if you go to irisreading.com and click on courses, you'll find it. Uh, it offers some unique ways to take notes. But however you take notes, after you inspect, you jot some things down. Write some things down, and uh, whatever it is you're writing down, you take note of things, and uh, you got that. Next, you're reading, and while you're reading, you're gonna be taking some notes, okay? And then, and then what? After we're done with that, we inquire, we ask questions about what we read. This is also an opportunity to take more notes. Then we store, we decide how am I gonna store my notes? But even if you have some notes that you've stored, how are you going to keep it really remembered? Because you can forget things later, even if you took notes. When should you review your notes? And um, here's something called the forgetting curve. You see, when you first learn something, you forget it fast. And then when you review your notes, you're looking at your sheet of paper and you're like, oh yeah, this is the stuff that I cut. Or you're looking at your digital notes. You're temporarily bringing it to top of mind. So here's the forgetting curve. You have time on the bottom, retention on the, on the uh, y-axis. So when you first learn something, you're going to forget it very fast unless you review. When you do review, notice how the curve, it's not as steep. You review again, not as steep. Notice how the periods of time when you review are getting wider and wider. Let's go over when exactly should you review. You can take a mathematical approach to this. If you're familiar with something like the Fibonacci sequence, it looks like this. We're going to use this to help us uh, remember things in a mathematically optimal way. Now, let me explain here. The Fibonacci sequence, the way it works, the way you get every additional number is it's a sum of the previous two numbers. So you add up the previous two numbers, one and one, and you get two. When you add up one and two, you get three, right? Two plus three is five, three plus five is eight, five plus eight is 13, you get the idea. But notice how the gaps are getting really small initially, they're really small. There's a gap of one here, a gap of two, gap of three, tiny little gaps, right? But then they start getting wider, five, eight, 13, 21, 34. They're getting exponentially wider. So here's the thing, when you review things and you're trying to remember, at first it's very important that you get your repetitions in very quick, very quick. But then after a few repetitions that are quick, you can start spacing them out wider and wider and wider. So we're gonna use this as a model to help us figure out when exactly should I review and let me give you an example. Let's say we got a timeline here. These are the Fibonacci numbers. One, one, two, three, and so on. And then we have when we should review. Okay, when should we review? Well, let's take an assumption. And this could be class notes. It could be book notes. You, you finished reading something at 12 noon. You're done. Or maybe you finished class at 12 noon and you got some notes for, from your class. And this is only applicable these uh, review periods, these are this is only applicable to situations where you got to remember something inside out, like you got to know this very well. So one hour later, that's the next Fibonacci number. One hour later, we're going to review at 1 p.m. Now, how long you review, it shouldn't take long, right? I mean, it depends on how much information you're reviewing, but let's say it's five minutes or less. Two hours later, you review it again at 3 p.m. Maybe you set a timer in your phone or on your calendar. Three hours later, review it again at 6 p.m. Five hours later, before you go to bed, review it again. Now, this doesn't have to be exactly at these time periods. These are just generalizations. Thank goodness we have eights next, because if you can get eight hours of sleep, they say that's pretty good, even though that's like one third of your lifetime. But anyway, eight hours later, at seven in the morning, you review your information once again. Now, at this point, you might know it really well, and you might stop this process. Or you might be like, you know what, I got a test tomorrow. I should review this again when 13 hours later at night. Notice how the gap now is really big. At first, the gap is really small, but we're interrupting the forgetting curve. You know, you see right here, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting. It's okay. One hour later, I'm remembering now. Oh, yeah, those notes I took or that chapter that I read. Well, guess what? I'm still going to forget. I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting, but slower. And now I bring it back top of mind two hours later at 3 p.m. But I'm still going to forget. 
three hours later. Eventually, this is no longer forgetting. Eventually, it's going to even out and it's going to become a vertical line of long term knowledge. That's hourly right here. But you could do this daily, right? Like one day later, two days later, three days later, five days later. You could do this on a monthly basis, one month later, two months later, three months later. I do that when I'm reading books casually. So I've got this book uh, on second thought. Its subtitle is Outsmarting Your Mind's Hardwired Habits. I've read this book recently, and I've got a note in my calendar to review my notes one hour later. Not one hour, I'm sorry, one month later. I would do one hour later, I would do it hourly if I got a test coming up on that book tomorrow or after tomorrow, and I need to know it inside out. But for me, I just read it out of personal interest, and I want to remember it long term, but I don't have a test. so. That's why the urgency isn't there. So I'm doing monthly instead, and I'll remember a month later, two months later, three months later, five months later, and eventually I'll cut this off. But this is called spaced repetition, and it's an effective way of getting things stuck in your head or really learned, I would say. Now, as far as improving your attention and focus, it's kind of like step number one. If we're going to remember anything, you got to pay attention. Like, you ever forget someone's name instantly? Again, my name's Paul. <laughs> you may have forgotten my name and it happens, but sometimes we forget instantly. It's not always a memory issue. Sometimes it's an attention issue. Maybe you weren't paying attention when I said the name. That's happened to me. Someone introduces themselves. I'm thinking about who is this person? What am I going to say? And I totally miss the name. That's not a memory issue. That's a focus issue. And uh, there's a really great book. The author's given us permission to freely distribute this book, Focus. And uh, if you shoot me an email after the session, I'll send you the PDF. It's a quick read. It's like about 100 pages in length. Lots of great practical tips to improve your focus. And that'll help you with, with studying, with reading, and just in general with productivity. Uh, shoot me an email, paul at irisreading.com, if you want me to send you that book. And also, if you want to take one of our advanced courses that dive deeper into things like speed reading, comprehension strategies, uh, memory, we kind of touched the, a bit of the surface here. But if you want to dive deeper into this topic or note taking, there are some unique ways of taking notes you might not be familiar with. And also personal productivity. All of these courses you can check out on our website if you go to irisreading.com slash courses. And use this code, my name, Paul, if you want to get an extra 30% off. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Also, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you want to get weekly updates, which we will be posting in the form of uh, videos that we upload that are shorter and sometimes these longer live streams, please feel free to subscribe to the channel just right below, hit subscribe. There's also like a little icon, uh, bell icon for uh, notifications when we decide to go live or when we have new videos. So you can hit that. And also here's my contact information if you want to connect later, uh, whether it's by email or you see a LinkedIn link there. Feel free to connect on LinkedIn. Just let me know you were checking out one of these sessions. Or if you want to follow on Instagram, feel free to do so. I hope you found today's session to be helpful. Uh, let me know in the comments any kind of questions you have or comments. I hope you found this helpful. And if you like what we're doing at Iris, tell your friends about us. If you don't like what we're doing, tell your enemies about us. But thank you so much for coming. And have a great rest of the day. Take care.